turn to global scale impacts um, of uh, climate change and turn to Nigel Arnell, who is a also has been working on this quite a quite a while, but not quite as long as John Hay. Um, he uh, Nigel is a professor of the of climate system science at University of Reading in the UK. He works on both national and global consequences of climate change. Initially, and this is what when I first uh, met Nigel, he was focused on uh, water resource impacts, climate change impacts on on hydrology and water resources. But lately, he's taken to um, look at multi-sectoral impacts, um, which I think is very, 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 very important transition. He's interested in risk assessment to echo John, John's lecture and the use of climate information. He also has been involved in many IPCC assessments, works closely with stakeholders in government and private sector. You can see these themes um, emerging of how this work is really, really done. And um, as Martin, I'm sure would be glad to uh, emphasize, he's trained as a geographer and uh, was director of the Walker Institute at the University of Reading between 2007 and 2014. Nigel, over to you. Thank you so much. And thanks so much, Cynthia. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, and hopefully everybody can see that now. Um, great, thanks. So I'm really very pleased to be able to talk about global scale consequences of climate change. And uh, in many senses, it follows on um, from what John was just talking about, although the scale is, is rather different. And it's about providing information in ways that's usable and, and actionable to a range of different users. Um, I've been working on the global scale consequences of climate change for, for nearly 30 years now. And we, we started with an initiative actually led by Martin Parry, um, known as the Fast Track Project, where the aim was basically to translate the output from the Met Office Hadley Center models, to translate them quickly into metrics and things that were particularly relevant to users, specifically ministers, um, as a way of getting beyond the climate change is a problem to do with temperature and rainfall, but it's a problem associated with food security and water resources and, and health and so on. And that essentially kicked off this interesting global scale analysis. And I've been carrying on with that for the last 30 years or so. And what I really want to do is talk about some of the process issues around estimating the global scale impacts of climate change. Um, without giving too much away, the, the global scale impacts of climate change are going to be pretty bad. Um, that's that's no, no secret. Um, the, the challenge is knowing how bad they're going to be and in what ways they're going to be bad and what effects climate policy has on how bad they are and, and, and so on. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is process, because the way we go about estimating these global scale consequences is actually important in influencing how the information that we provide is used. So I'm really going to be looking at three things today. Um, I want to look at why we're interested in the global scale impacts. Um, it's pretty clear why we might be interested in the impacts of climate change in a big ocean, small island state. Um, there are real adaptation, practical adaptation issues to address. Uh, why are we interested in the global scale impacts? Um, there are some specific challenges with estimating the global scale impacts of climate change, which I'll talk about. And I'm going to finish with an example of how we've estimated these global scale impacts. Now, the, the slides are pretty much the same as in the book, but I've, I've changed the example a little bit, uh, as we'll see as we get through that in, in a moment. So why are we interested in the global scale impacts of climate change? Um, and there are essentially three reasons. And I think why we are interested influences to a certain extent, what we do and the sorts of indicators and metrics that, that we calculate, the, the purposes are different. The first one, um, which is where we started, um, and actually is probably the highest profile at the moment, is to really raise awareness of the potential consequences of climate change in terms that are relevant to people who are seeking to make big international decisions. Uh, related to that, information on the global scale consequences of climate change help inform the development of climate mitigation policy. In a sense, it helps us influence what we think are appropriate targets or what the consequences of not hitting targets might be, which is important if we're trying to compare um, the cost effectiveness or the, 
distributional aspects of different mitigation measures, for example. And the third objective might be to help inform international adaptation and resilience policy. And that um, really relates back to some of the stuff that John was talking about, um, about providing information on to help decision makers make choices and decisions about where to prioritize adaptation and resilience resources. The information that these three different groups, if you like, need is it can be quite different. So different objectives, um, and we need to be aware of that when we're undertaking an assessment of global scale consequences. There are, in effect, two primary challenges when we're trying to estimate the global scale impacts. Um, the first one is, well, what is it we're trying to measure? What is it we're trying to characterize? How do we define the impacts of climate change? And the second is, how do we construct climate scenarios that, we, that are credible and robust across the global domain? The problem's quite different to trying to estimate climate projections at the local scale. So what do we mean by impacts and consequences? Um, the first thing to note is that often we might think we're interested in the dollar cost of climate change or the cost in terms of impacts on livelihoods on some you know, the, the real quote unquote impacts of climate change but that's actually really quite difficult to estimate because it depends on so many different unknowable things such as the way we respond to climate change the nature of the measures that are already in place to deal with weather extremes um, and some of this at the local global scale we just don't know so seeking to try and estimate what the impact in um, economic or human livelihood terms and so on is, is really quite challenging. So a more appropriate way of looking at it and thinking at the problem is to look at indicators of change. So indicators of aspects of climate risk that relate to the consequences of climate change, although aren't exactly explicitly the consequences of climate change. So rather than, for example, the average annual flood loss in dollars, something like what's the change in the chance of the current 50 year flood, for example. It's a metric that is relevant to understanding flood risk, but it's not dollar damage in, in flood risk. And we can come up with a series of these types of indicators. So thinking that we're not trying to estimate the, in quantitative terms, the impacts of climate change, but we're trying to characterize indicators of things that relate to what people conceive of as the impacts of climate change is, is really quite an important step. And that helps us enormously. A second key aspect is separating out the various things that relate, drive these impacts, these indicators relevant to climate impacts and risks. And this diagram that was in initially introduced essentially to the climate community through the IPCC SREX report, it, it, fundamentally comes from the disaster risk reduction community, is, has been proven to be really very helpful. It tells us that climate risk or climate impact is a function of the, the weather and climate events, the, the left-hand part of this propeller diagram, um, but how it, these weather and climate events combine with exposure, what, what assets are in the way of the event, and vulnerability, what are the consequences for the owners or occupiers of that asset if that asset is, is damaged by an event. And separating out these different components of risk is proved to be really, really very helpful. Um, and we can construct indicators that relate to different components of this uh, as we're trying to estimate the global scale consequences of climate change. A um, couple of things to point out from this, this figure here. Um, we can, subject to addressing the challenges that I'll talk about in a moment, seek to characterize in a quantitative way the current and future weather and climate events, the, the hazards and resources that we're, we're facing. We can, subject to various assumptions, make some quantitative estimates of how exposure, for example, assets in, in floodplains and so on, might change over time. But we can't estimate quantitatively the things that affect current and future vulnerability and how they might change, because they're very often related to aspects such as governance, access to resource, access to power, and so on. So separating the drivers of risk out in this way has been really helpful because it's allowed us to separate out the bits that we can quantify from the bits that we can't. And I'm gonna come back to that as we get towards the end. 
So this distinction between the, the things that affect the hazard or the resource and the things that affect the exposure and vulnerabilities is, is really important. And related to that is this development um, dates back to seven or eight years ago now, this idea that you can essentially mix and match projections of change in the, the physical hazard uh, with change in the socioeconomic conditions that determine exposure and vulnerability in what became known as, as a matrix approach, where essentially you can have scenarios describing change in hazard and resource on the this part of the table, the, the, the vertical bit, and you can look at what those different climate changes might be against different socioeconomic worlds. And many of you will probably be familiar with the idea of the shared socioeconomic pathways, SSPs, that are increasingly used in climate impact research, although they differ in some important respects from the sorts of socioeconomic scenarios that are used in other sectors. That's actually an issue. Um, and on the vertical side, you may be familiar with the concept of representative concentration pathways or RCPs. These are different forcings of the climate system that are used to simulate climate. And in principle, the idea initially was that you could come up with measures of the climate hazard based on the level of forcing and combine those with measures of the socioeconomic system as characterized by these socioeconomic scenarios and fill in this matrix of what the consequences of climate change would be. And it gives you some clues as to the relative importance of the rate of climate change and the relative importance of the socioeconomic assumptions in determining what the consequences of climate change might be. And this approach has been increasingly used. Um, it has to be said, it's not always being used quite in the way it was initially intended. Um, might want to pursue that in discussions. And also the initial idea was that you can basically mix and match any socioeconomic and climate forcing in this matrix approach. Um, increasingly, some groups believe that some of these um, combinations are, are physically impossible um, and that it's not gonna happen. So there's some issue about whether all the elements of this matrix can be filled in. Um, and that again is something we might want to pursue as a methodological issue. But anyway, this distinction between scenarios describing the climate and scenarios describing the socioeconomics is, is really quite an important one. So that's the indicators. We need to think, we have to think carefully about what we mean by the global scale consequences of climate change. I want to look now at the um, some of the issues about how we construct climate scenarios at the global scale, because they're that they're different to some of the issues we might have at the local scale. Um, most obviously, we when we're trying to calculate global scale impacts, we might want to use the um, projections from a climate model, um, which describes different impacts of climate change in different parts of the world. Um, just assuming you know, what would happen with a, everything being two degrees warmer isn't necessarily particularly realistic when we're looking at global variations. So we, we, we turn, first of all, to global climate models. Um, but for reasons that we probably all know about, we can't just reformat the output from a climate model and use those simulations directly. There are all sorts of reason, uh, differences between the models and reality that mean that that's really quite challenging. And, and the climate science and the impact community have known about this for a long time. And there's an awfully large literature on how to, to deal with that. There are a series of different methods for constructing the scenarios that we might want to use at the global scale, going from the climate model output down to usable information um, that might go into some impact model, such as a crop model or a hydrological model. Again, there's a long discussion and long literature about that, and there are long arguments about um, delta methods or bias adjustments, which I'm not going to go into. Um, in my view, the differences aren't huge, but the, um, the practicalities are quite different with the two different approaches. But what we haven't really talked about so much, um, and I think is becoming an increasing issue, is this disconnect between the sorts of scenarios that are used um, to run the global climate models and the sorts of scenarios that actually people want to use when looking at the global scale consequences of, for example, international climate policy. Um, climate models are typically um, run with these RCP forcings that I mentioned a while ago. Um, and there are good scientific reasons for doing that. You'll be familiar with RCP 8.5 and RCP 2.6, perhaps. 
Um, and they're very good scientifically because they're testing the way the climate system responds to weak and strong forcings. But they don't map very closely onto policy relevant estimates of the future. There's a long discussion in bits of the literature, in bits of the community about whether RCP 8.5 is unrealistically high or not. Is it a feasible worst case or is it something more central? So there's this disconnect between what users often want to know about future climate and what the climate modeling community, for good reasons, are able to produce. Um, so, for example, we might want to say, what are the effects of the agreements made in COP26 on the impacts of climate change at the global scale? We can't directly infer that by using a climate model and then working out what the impacts and consequences are. So we need to come up with some clever methods to try and translate the information we get from the limited number of climate model runs we have to the wider range of climate you know, policy relevant climate futures we might be interested in. And um, it also relates to this issue about whether users want information by time or by level of warming. There's quite a move in the science community to express results in terms of level of warming. What are the impacts at two degrees of global warming, three degrees, four degrees, and so on, um, which is good, but I get the sense it, it doesn't really resonate with many policymakers who are they interested in time. Um, and that's an interesting um, discussion perhaps to have um, again later. So I'm going to be talking about some of the uh, an example of the way we've, we've tried to address some of these issues um, by using climate information um, to try and come up with projections of the consequences of climate change at for, for different policy relevant rates of emissions. Um, and essentially, without going into it in a huge amount of detail, one way we can begin to address that is to construct relationships between some simple measure of global climate change, for example, global mean temperature, with some metric of impact aggregated across space. Um, we call these relationships damage functions, but there are other terms that are used. Um, and essentially, you can see in these sort of three steps, you, you, you construct a damage function um, relating impact, symmetric impact against global average temperature. And this is based on a range of techniques we could use for, for scaling the output from different climate models and so on and so forth. Um, we have a distribution of what the temperature change might be in a particular year, say 2050, based on a particular climate policy assumption. And we can estimate this using a simple climate model. And then we'd basically just multiply the two together and we can come up with a distribution of the potential impacts in a particular year. And I've shown here on this slide, the median plus sort of a high and a low range. Now, we don't take the distributions too literally, but we can come up with some idea of what a sort of central estimate and what some idea of the range might be. And we can apply this approach with different projections of change in temperature to come up with some idea about the consequences of, of different climate policies. So I'm going to finish with an example um, where essentially we're asking the question, so what are the impacts at different rates of emissions um, at the global scale? And what does this imply for the, for the choice of policy targets? Now, the implications for what it means for policy targets is a policy question, uh, and it's not for us as the scientists to to answer, we can provide information and evidence to help inform the selection of policy targets. Um, and the approach that we followed essentially was to, to look back at the what we, what we mean by global scale consequences of climate change. So to identify some indicators of impact covering a range of different sectors that were relevant to the policymakers that we were talking with. Um, I won't go into the details of how we did this, but we used the what was then the current generation of climate models to define the spatial pattern of change in rainfall and temperature, which translate into impacts and consequences, which we estimated using impact models. Um, we use that to, to define the change in hazard. We then combine them with the socioeconomic projections to translate those hazards into some metrics of impact. And then we constructed the damage functions and then applied with temperature projections. So it's quite a convoluted process, and it's probably not one that you would follow if you're looking to estimate impacts at the local scale. You'll probably do things differently. Uh, I'm going to look 
here very briefly at five example indicators just to give you a flavor of the range of things that we looked at and the diversity of responses uh, and because that's really quite important um, just choosing one indicator might give you a rather biased perception of what the consequences of climate change might be and what the consequences of different policies might be so look across sectors um, so we're looking here at some metrics related to drought river floods um, heat waves and a particular thing related to some aspect of crop um, risk crop failure details that aren't hugely specific we could argue for hours over what precise metrics we used that's not really the point of this this exercise um and so for each of those um we first of all constructed these relationships between level of forcing um and impact by essentially running our impact models with these global climate scenarios rescaled um, to represent change per degree of warming. And one thing that we can immediately see from these five different examples is that, well, the shapes of the relationships are different of between level of forcing and consequence. So for example, our metric of heat wave increases really quite dramatically with quite low warming and then levels off basically because everywhere gets exposed to heat wave. The, the thing saturates out. Whereas some of the other indicators, there's perhaps a suggestion that they begin to they accelerate, whereas others are a bit more linear. And the, the lines represents the uncertainty range, and it's telling us that there's different uncertainties for these different metrics. As I say, details aren't particularly important. In a sense, this is information on impacts at different levels of warming. Because I say, that's rather abstract for users because they need to know when we hit a two degree world a two degree value is it 2050 is it 2080 it makes a difference um, this is the one that's ever so slightly different from the one in the slide pack um, in the slide pack i showed an example which actually used the rcp forcings here i'm using a set of more policy relevant forcings based on a more recent analysis that um, we did with a group of colleagues led by aj gambier at um, imperial college uh, which was part of an exercise to compare physical risks of climate change with the transition risks of reducing emissions. Another reason why we were interested in impacts of climate change. On the left, we see an example uh, a plot of um, different plausible emissions futures. So the black line is what happens if there are no new climate policies from today. Um, the brown line is a set of emissions that would be consistent with a one and a half degree world. And the dotted line is the sort of emissions consistent with a world in which every country met the pledges that it had made before COP26, not the ones at COP26, so that needs to be updated a bit. And on the right, we see the temperature changes that we get associated with these different emissions. So the range on, the, on this bar up here is the range in our temperature uncertainty associated with a particular emissions profile. That, in a sense, is a climate science uncertainty. And what we've done is basically multiplied those damage functions we saw just now with those temperature functions we saw just then. And this is the global total, um, global average, in, actually the global average of all these different indicators. Um, and essentially the black lines are what happens if we continue without any new climate policy. And the, the brown line at the bottom is what happens if we reduce emissions consistent with a one and a half degree target. As I say, I'm not going to go into detail here. All of these are globally, the global average is going in the wrong direction, is bad. Um, the uncertainty range is pretty large, uh, which is important when we're trying to come up with decisions about what to do in terms of adaptation priorities. Um, and there are two other things I'd like to point out from here. One is that even with a one and a half degree world, we still will have impacts that are different or greater, more extreme than those we're seeing at the moment. So a one and a half degree world isn't stopping the impacts of climate change. It has a bigger effect in some areas than others, which is quite interesting in itself, but it doesn't eliminate the problem of climate change. The second point, and this is quite a challenging one to get across to decision makers, is that there isn't much difference between these different emissions futures in terms of the impacts of climate change until the 2040s, maybe 2050s. So it takes a long time before we see any benefit of climate of reducing emissions uh, but if we don't start reducing them soon we don't 
see any effect towards the end of the century. And that mismatch in timing between when we would see the benefits of reducing emissions and when we would perhaps take the pain of measures to reduce emissions with different timescales is, is quite a, a challenging point to get across to, to decision makers. So here we've got just the measure of the hazards and we got some idea of the uncertainty range and we can perhaps in discussion and pick what some of the key sources of this uncertainty are. As I say, some of it is due to how the climate system responds globally and some of it is associated with where bits get wetter or bits get drier. Um, there's variation across space. So although that was the global aggregate, um, there can be quite big and so significant differences in different parts of the world. So when we're looking at the global consequences of climate change, we shouldn't just look at the global total or the global average. It may be much more important that particular parts of the world would be extremely significantly affected. So in this particular example, we see that the um, India, South Asia, gets particularly affected by an increase in river flood risk, but with a massive uncertainty. Other parts of the world, perhaps less so. So the geographic distribution of change in risk is really important when we're looking at the global scale. We shouldn't just look at the global average. Right, um, coming to the end now, um, that was looking at the change in the physical hazard and resource, the number of heat wave days, the chance of a flood and, and so on and so forth. We then multiplied that by exposure to get some idea of how some other metric of impact, hazard times exposure, changes over time. And for these three examples here, we've got these five different socioeconomic assumptions, um, different socioeconomic pathways. For the two agricultural ones, we, we don't, we assume cropland stays the same, but that doesn't really matter. All I'm doing here is just basically rescaling the, the indicator. But this shows at the global scale, the global total number of people, let's concentrate on the people ones, exposed to drought, river flooding, or at least one heat wave a year. And this is in 2030. And each column is the different climate futures and the five bars are the different socioeconomic assumptions. That we make um, in basically saying how many people there are. So by 2030, there's not much difference between them. We get to 2050 and we begin to see a difference between the different colours, the different climate forcings, but we begin to see a difference between the different socioeconomic assumptions. When we get to 2100, we begin to see there's a very big difference between the climate futures and really quite a big difference between the socioeconomic futures. So if we're trying over the long term to estimate the global scale consequences of climate change, you really do need to look at how our socioeconomic conditions and assumptions change over time. They determine the answer. That's really, really important. Right. So these are all what we could think of as measures, the direct measures of the consequences of climate change. They're things that we can relatively easily, subject to the challenges I just talked about, we can quantify them. Um, they're, they're relatively straightforward, um, drought, flooding, and so on. Um, and there's regional variation, which we we'll, won't talk about. Um, but increasingly, what we find is that a lot of people, uh, and these range from Greta Thunberg to the US Department of Defense, an interesting um, spread, are interested not in the direct impacts of climate change, but in the, the, the big things, the risks to um, displacement, food security, um, conflict, migration, um, massive loss of livelihoods and so on, these big systemic risks. So what I think is a really interesting next stage is to build on the stuff that work people are doing to be able to characterize the direct impacts of climate change that you can plausibly quantify under different assumptions and blend that with more nuanced narrative information about the things that determine exposure and vulnerability to come up with plausible stories about how systemic risks, these big systemic risks that, that people are really concerned about would change into the future. And this is a really exciting opportunity, I think. There is some stuff out there on some of these big risks, um, but I have to say, I think a lot of it is a bit arm wavy, it's a bit vague, um, and it uses inconsistent sources of information, which makes it quite difficult to compare the relative importance of different risks and so on. So I think this is a really interesting new area when we're looking at global risks and consequences, blending quantitative information with insights about how 
essentially governance changes exposure and vulnerability and maps onto the really big things that, that we're worried about. So to conclude, um, we do have the technologies to estimate the direct consequences of climate change. There are some big technical challenges and um, there are some that related to particular indicators that I haven't talked about, which pose additional complications. It's really interesting to try and work out how we can combine this quantitative information robustly with qualitative information, expert judgment, in order to estimate the really big risks that often are of concern. Um, when we're thinking at the global scale, the, the global headline is that things are getting worse, um, but there are quite big differences between regions. I, I did rather gloss over that in, the, in this highlight presentation. But what happens in a particular place may be particularly significant for the globe as a whole. Uh, now, some places will be more important than others. Um, we can think of hotspots or, or flashpoints or, or, or whatever. And the last key point I want to make is that the magnitude of impacts, if not necessarily the direction, although that's for some indicators that is an issue, is uncertain. And this is really important when we're trying to come up with well, measures to think about what, what, uh, what emissions do we need, how do we need to reuse emissions, and, and how do we plan adaptation, and how do we assess the consequences. And one of the things that I um, really want to just highlight here is this issue about how we deal with uncertainty. And one of the things I think we've learned in COVID is how many organisations and, and many people are increasingly thinking, of, well, you go for the worst case. Um, we've often in the climate science community began to think about, you know, you, you, you plan for like a central estimate, and then you have a bit of a a, a band around the central estimate but i think the mood is probably shifting generally a lot of organizations are increasingly worried about dealing with the worst case not the at the central case and that poses again a series of additional challenges for how we estimate the impacts of climate change thank you Thank you, Nigel. Thank you so much. I'm clapping. I'm the designated clapper. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's we, I, the work has come a long way from the fast track I, that we because we did the uh, agriculture sector yeah. work and you did the water resources sector, and uh, oh, it's just wonderful how that how you have developed that that initial concept just so rigorously and thoughtfully um to uh in you know with with the further elaborations along the um rcps the ssps um uh and then the, the linkage to the policy so thank you so much for the q a we're going to turn to jen evans um who um, is a uh, young researcher with us at the uh, Climate Impacts Group at uh, NASAGIS and Columbia Center for Climate Systems Research. So Jen, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you so much, Nigel, for that wonderful presentation. Uh, so we do have some questions coming in uh, to the Q&A box, but I did want to start uh, just with the same question that we asked John and kind of if you could expand on your journey in climate change research and kind of how things have evolved and, and how different it is now from when you first began. Okay, right. Um, well, I started more than 30 years ago on climate research, climate change research, and I was very much coming to it from the, um, it's a challenge that needs adapting to type perspective. So didn't come into it from a science perspective. I was initially coming to it from um, essentially the water industry in the UK thinking climate change might be a problem. What do we do about it? So for my entire career, I've been basically coming at it a problem from organisations seeking to adapt and respond to climate change. And I've shifted to more looking at the policy side in terms of emissions and how we use climate information to re reduce emissions. Um, I've, some of the tech, some things have changed in the sense that you no longer feel you're having to convince people that climate is happening. Um, that's different um, to the extent that we've we've adjusted our introduction to climate change course and you know teaching the undergraduate students. We don't have to spend so much time telling them how to convince the skeptics. That's no longer an issue. Um, and I think the the, the pushback that we're we're getting about why there isn't certain action to do with climate change, whether it's adaptation, 
or whether it's emissions is changing. And that has changed, I think, the way we're looking at how to provide information in order to make actionable decisions. Um, I think, I'm not sure about other countries, but within the UK, there's there's a pretty strong recognition that we do need to you know, have more robust techniques for factoring in climate change into infrastructure. And essentially, it's, it's just a question of discussing what those, you know, the mechanics of how we do that, which is some interesting discussions about worst case or central case. Um, but some of the other issues where we get pushback on, so do we need to do this or, you know, but it'll be bad. Um, that because the, the, the arguments against doing something have shifted, the arguments that we have to put in place to counter them have shifted. Um, and that's why that paper that, um, the, the example I've put in at the end, uh, I, I changed that from the one in the um, in the slide book. And it, the paper actually is comparing what are known as transition risks, the risks of transitioning to a low carbon economy with physical risks. So essentially we, we know that if you go to a low carbon economy, some parts of the economy will lose, using a sort of straightforward winners losers argument. Um, and those that's where the pushback is coming from. But what are those losses compared to the physical risks of not dealing with those transition risks? So the way we're po the, the questions are being posed are different. And the sort of information we have to provide is shifting as, in a sense, the, the, the obstacles to doing something about climate change are changing. Uh, and frankly, in, so in most cases, the obstacles aren't information, they're to do with governance and priorities. They probably always have been, but we probably thought it was a science thing earlier on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so let me move on to Thomas Brewer's question, who says, existing models, of course, focus on gases and usually neglect the particulate matter black carbon, which is among the most potent climate forcing agents, including in particular the Arctic region. Is there research in progress to incorporate BC in models? Uh, yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, uh, current generation climate models mostly, as far as I understand it, include it, but there's uncertainty in A, the effect of these aerosols, um, and one of the big science community into comparisons was looking at that, uh, and B, there's uncertainty in how they might change in the future. But one of the things that we do know is that the geographic, the, the amount and distribution of aerosols makes a difference to the amount and location of changes in climate. Um, and that actually is one of the big challenges in how we go from the climate models, the big climate models that the climate science community are using to something that is perhaps relevant for other policy relevant emission scenarios, because it does actually make it challenging to, in a sense, interpolate between the different model projections of different rates of emissions. If you've got this extra spatial pattern of effect of reducing aerosols, to add on to that. So that's an active area of research or or definitely should be. There was some stuff done on this in the 1990s, um, but it probably needs to be revisited with better understanding of how essentially to blend these patterns. But it relates to this big point about what I see as a disconnect between the, the big climate science community, the modeling community, who are doing really good modeling stuff, but because those models are really complicated and they take a long time to run and they're asking really important science questions, those aren't the same as the ones that the policy community are interested in. So blending that, <laughs> merging from one to the other is a real, real challenge. And you've, you've highlighted one of the real challenges. There are some others, but that's one of the big ones. Perfect, thank you. So we have uh, time for one more question. Uh, so this is from Stefan Franzek. Uh, could you explain your view about the reliability of global scale impact models compared to models that are developed at local to regional scale? Should global models be used for regional assessments? Okay, again, another good question. Um, that, in the examples I showed, um, each the models were all apply, applied at what we think of as the local scale. Um, actually, it was half by half degree, which is about 50 by 50 kilometers which is not very local, but you know, the point is you, you build it up from the bottom up. Um, by doing that, you may get a good global picture of what the aggregated consequences are. But if you drill down to any one individual grid square, you may not get what is a locally precise answer because 
local conditions will be slightly different and you know, the, the indicator that you use might be slightly different and and so on and so forth so there is this tension between what to do at the global scale and what to do at the local scale um, and actually i've also found this in the uk there's a tension between what we provide at the national scale and users wanting to know what's going to happen in their zip code um, and so there's a, always going to be scale tension always regardless of what scale you work at but this is a, an interesting point and it's um it's partly to do with how you define what you mean by impact and consequence, and it's how you use the information. Um, the, the big scale gives you an idea of overall direction of change in metrics that are relevant, but you wouldn't want to use the big scale to come up with a specific concrete, literally concrete adaptation decision. Um, so that's one answer to that question. You, and whether that's global to local or national, to local same applies you, you look at the bigger scale for context to help inform strategy and direction of change but you wouldn't use that to, to pour concrete the second part of the answer is you probably wouldn't want to rely on any climate projections literally when you're pouring concrete um, adaptation and resilience should be much much more sophisticated and flexible than relying on climate projections at whatever scale because there are all sorts of reasons why that's a bad move which is perhaps a theme for the, the, the book as a whole, um, how you go from climate information to making decisions. We shouldn't fall into the trap of you need really precise, detailed local climate information to make decisions. Um, we, you don't need that at all. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for the questions. I think, uh, yeah, they really expanded on, on the lecture quite well. Um, so I'll pass it back to uh, Cynthia and David who will be doing the discussion now uh, with our authors. Wonderful. Um, David, over to you for, um, Joel Smith had a, had a very interesting question about transformation. Um, uh, and of course, we want to ask our author, our lecturers, what they think we should, everyone should be doing next. But over to you. To why don't you take the lead here? Thank you. Sorry, it helps if I unmute myself. Uh, and so I'll ask Joel if he'd like to present his question. Okay. Thanks, and if. I might, um, I might add a question for Nigel, but let me first note, if I may, because we had some uh, exceptional important news uh, late last week that I think these, and these talks are exemplary. These are great talks, by the way. I really enjoyed both of them. Um, and I want to say, in a way, it's a tribute to Cynthia for helping, uh, you know, organize all this. And, and you and I have had the pleasure of working together for many decades, Cynthia. And one of the things I have come to admire is not just your brilliance and how good a science you are, but your dedication, your hard work, but the way you can also get many smart people, many big egos together, you know, in a, in a, in a complex project and, you, and you're, you know, you're hurting these sheep or cats or whatever, and you get us to produce. And, and I got to say, it's, it's, it's exceptional. And therefore, you know, when I saw you won the World Food Prize, it's no surprise you know, because you know it just it's just a tribute, as I say, not just to your contribution, your brilliance and your contribution to science, but your organizational capabilities and your drive. And I mean that in a positive way. And so, you know, hats off to you. Um, so let me just then to say, uh, thank turn... you, thank you, Joel, for that. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled yeah. and honored. Thanks so much. You, you should be thrilled and honored. It's exceptionally, <laughs> as Martin put it so well, you know, following Norman Borlaug. I mean, gosh, what more needs to be said, right? And okay, so great, let me. Here's what, great for climate impacts. That's yes. my last word. <laughs> yes. So I want to, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll restate the question I had for John. And John, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, and it struck me, and I, by the way, I, I just had the pleasure working with the framework, the UN Framework Convention Secretariat on the so-called adaptation stock take. And it's now out, uh, the, the, well, I think it's, they call it a final report. It may well be more like a draft final. And maybe when I get a chance, I'll post a link to it in a chat. But we were looking at what countries were saying they're doing about adaptation. And what struck me was that many of the measures, whether it's sea level rise, flooding, others, are what we might call defensive, you know, seawalls, uh, protections, 
flood barriers, that kind of thing. And that's all fine, you know, to keep essentially to protect livelihoods, settlement systems as they are. And that makes sense. Much less attention to transformation. And I think this is, and I think this picks up on Nigel's comment, and I completely agree about overemphasis on RCP 8.5. Nonetheless, one should not ignore the potential for extreme scenarios. And sea level rise is a great example where, you know, it seems most likely we'll get a meter or less by 2100, but there are low probabilities that it could be significantly higher. You know, if we get very rapid melting of the major ice sheets, as an example. Um, and so, and that raised the question of how far can adaptation go? And so uh, that, you know, the issue, and should small islands, but others too, not just coastal areas, drought prone areas, other, other places, you know, address the need for transformation. And that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, saying, okay, we're going to abandon ship, we've got to retreat, but maybe in a notion of adaptive management or pathways approach, thinking through, you know, what point do we, you know, do we think about whether, you know, can we defend what's there? Or is it just, there's just too much sea level rise or too much, and you mentioned other important things too, ocean acidification or whatever it may be. Um, and then if I may, may I, ask, may I also pose a, a comment for Nigel? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so I think also, I thought also great talk, Nigel, and I think it is very interesting. I mean, one thing to point out, and I completely agree with you on the, on the question of, of scenarios, and I think particularly thinking through what are the more quote unquote likely emission pathways, but also, you know, not ignoring the potential that things still can go, um, go awry and maybe we have much more warming than we thought. Um, I would point out that, it, I mean, a question for you is my sense is that a lot of these studies are still based on the assumption that climate changes on average and may not fully incorporate changes in climate variability, you know, particularly, at, you know, multi-decadal scale, interannual, smaller scales, but I don't know if that's incorporated. And I think as we're seeing, as we observe climate change, it's these, these changes in variability are turning out to be very important too. Some of which we knew about, we knew precipitation events would get more extreme, um, in, you know, including tropical cyclones. And that's, a, I think John had uh, mentioned that as well, but, but also as changes, you know, changes in circulation patterns, strong heat waves that are persistent, um, you know, mega, we're experiencing a mega drought in the Southwest United States of really of uh, multi-century proportions exacerbated by climate change. So that's an interesting issue in terms of looking at impacts, how much, you know, how much might we be missing by not addressing uh, variability. And I just wanna make a comment too, because I'm curious about this, that, you know, and, and Cynthia and I worked together on the first iteration of burning embers. Okay, burning embers was an attempt to say, what's, what's dangerous an anthropogenic interference? And you could interpret the results a different way. One way is that, well, there are these different outcomes at a global scale, and Nigel rightly pointed out they also differ at sub-global scales, particularly regional and local scales. And you can see, quote unquote, dangerous or very significant impacts at very different levels of temperature change. And it's interesting, and maybe this is a critical, I think what a message we're trying to send to the policy community is, well, tell us what you're worried about. But instead, this, the response we get back is, no, you tell us what the temperature is. And they will go ahead and work at that. And I find that, well, we're a small group, intellectually lazy. You know, I just think that it's not as if there's a, and I think your, your diagram shows very well, there's no single threshold that's safe or unsafe. There's a, you know, there are multitudes, a myriad of, of thresholds. And it may be a matter of, I don't know, you know, maybe we have to just push as hard as we can as a global community to mitigate the impacts and adapt to the rest as best we can. So I'll stop there, you know, but it comments for everybody, but thanks for letting me drone on a little, David. <laughs> Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Phil. Very valuable comments, though. I have just a quick question for John. I, my, my opinion is that nothing is really going to be able to be pushed forward politically until the average person in the street is talking about climate change frequently. And that will get politicians' ears, because as we know, politicians have short range thinking. And if people are talking about something uh, in, a, in a very casual and frequent way, then politicians can incorporate that into their political campaigns. So given, as you say, John, you are on the front line, if one were, walk, were to walk around in some of the Pacific Islands, how often now are people talking about 
climate change, or does it just arise when some flood or tropical storm occurs? Well, thanks for that question. And it <laughs> um, prompts a, a multiplicity of answers um, because one size doesn't fit all in terms of even the Pacific, let alone globally. But I'll just give you two examples. And, and the depressing example is that um, we had a, in the Pacific a very effective spokesman at a global level in, in the form of the uh, former president, or well, he was then president of Kiribati, uh, President Tong. And he, he was very um, much on, on the global scene as a spokesperson for uh, island states and, and others that were um, at to use my word, at the front line of, of climate change. Uh, but when you looked at um, what was happening domestically in Kiribati, and there was an election um, upcoming, there was absolutely no discussion in, in the, um, by the political parties about climate change. It didn't feature in the election um, debates. And this disconnect between what um, even island countries are saying on the global scene and what is happening at home is very worrying. And I, I, it, it really did depress me when I saw the, the, the two sides of this gentleman um, and taking uh, political uh, opportunities globally and then in terms of climate change and then completely forgetting about them um, domestically. But at, at the other um, side of it is that um, because extreme weather and climate events are almost a daily occurrence in the Pacific, you, you, you can't even now take a controlled experiment and say, well, is it just the response to extremes that gets people talking, or is it a, a more pervasive um, discussion topic? Um, and but if if you uh, travel around the Pacific as as I have, um, climate change, and I have to say, particularly for the younger people, the older people are uh, less. Um, persuaded that this is uh, a, a change driven by increasing um, greenhouse gas emissions or just part of natural variability. And I'm not saying this from them as implying that they're skeptics, but they have been living, the older people have been living with natural variability, let's put it that way. And so uh, are preoccupied with existing in, in a situation of natural variability rather than worrying about something that might come in, in, in future decades in the form of climate change. But when you get to the younger people, um, then it's a different story. They understand the problem. They understand uh, the science in, in, in the, at a level of, of a of a child, and I'm not being derogatory when I say that, but they understand it from, from their uh, elementary uh, level of education. And they get that the, the fact even that something has to be done now in order, and, and, and the, the um, lecture um, highlighted this point that we need to act now um, in order to address a problem of, that's going to be impacting us seriously in the future. And the younger people in the Pacific get this. And so one has to have hope that um, the next generation of, of uh, voters coming through will actually cause a shift in the region and, and we'll see more um, domestic policies and politics uh, rather than just what's happening um, internationally. Well, it's nice to then end that on a potentially positive note. Cynthia, over to you. Um, 
uh, Nigel, why don't you go ahead and uh, take Joel's question um, and then um, and maybe give your thoughts on transformation also and, and we'll end. Uh, we have five more minutes, so if you can um, uh, maybe give your uh, last remarks and then we'll have uh, last thoughts from John and uh, then we'll go to the wrap up. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, um, so to respond to Joel's point, um, yeah, when we're trying to work out the consequences of climate change, then it's not just shifting the mean. Um, it is looking at the consequences of that for change in variability. Um, there is a constraint that it's, our estimates of how that might change are constrained by what the models do, um, which, ex which, which actually opens up another avenue about thinking more creatively about what worst cases might be. And as I say, COVID has meant we think differently about what worst cases might be. So we've got another project, which is looking at worst case scenarios effectively across the UK, where we're trying to use a whole blend of information about what could a plausible worst case be in terms that are relevant to the users. And I, I just accept there's a circularity between what do you want, what can you provide? So we go on that discussion so many times um, and it gets a bit circular. Um, and that, but that's a real issue. So yeah, there are ways of addressing it and it's not just a question of just shifting the mean. It is, you know, we do look at change in variability and so on, but given the range, um, shifting the mean, it just the consequence of shifting the mean, even on you know, occurrence of, 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 of extremes is really quite dramatic. Um, back to the other point about um, transition and change. Um, and I think uh, John mentioned about um, there not being much political discussion at the local level about climate change. And the same has been the case in the UK um, in each, each of the last two or three elections. Climate change has, has not appeared at all. Um, and that's primarily because all the parties in principle accept it. Um, and it's not, a, it's, it's not a differentiator between the parties. So they're, you know, they, they concentrate on things that separate them out from each other. Um, having said that, what's become clear in the last couple of years is that what does differentiate parties and more importantly, bits within parties is how you deal with climate change. So it's the, these transition risks turn out to be really important. And one of the reasons I think is that transition risks, you're gonna lose your job, you're gonna pay higher gas bills, are much easier to understand than you might suffer in a heat wave in five years time. Um, and it's to do with you know, consequences, of it, having events which cause some consequence when it's in their environmental events, they're a bit more abstract except when you've had one, which is not really the right way of raising the profile. You don't want to have them. Um, but things like you're, you're going to lose your job because we're cutting back on coal, you're going to have higher gas bills, you're not going to be able to fly. Those are things that people can understand. So the way we have to present and talk about these different risks, I think, is shifting quite dramatically. And that, to me, is where the political pressure, political differentiation is going to be. Um, so in terms of more sophisticated arguments, it's looking at the transition, um, because I think convincing people that in places where there haven't been recent nasty events, that there might be some in the future. Uh, we, we know from decades of hazard research is that people forget <laughs> that hazards happen and you know, that floods happen in floodplains. You know, they forget. Um, but it's more difficult to forget you might lose a job because of, of rising gas bills and so on. Wonderful. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you so much. John, you get the last word. If you could give a one minute, uh, your final thought to the, to the webinar. Thank you. And then, uh, then I'll do a quick wrap up. Well, two very quick thoughts. One is that these webinars are a wonderful opportunity to link disparate parts of the book and to show the commonality commonalities and, and how there are important learnings from one part of the book in a, to another part of the book. And finally, I say just want to say that um, these webinars also are an opportunity to just reflect on the amazing contribution, not only of, of um, 
Martha and Perry, who the book was in honor of, but also um, of people like yourself, Cynthia. It's really um, provided an opportunity for us all to acknowledge your contributions and congratulations on your recent award. Well, thank you so much. But you know what? Right back at both of you and at, to all the authors. That's to really to what one of the goals was to bring the community together. And thanks also to Thomas for the for the um, for the shout out in the chat. Um, we're so glad that that these that the that the lectures, the webinar, the book are be are being helpful and stimulating this kind of discussion. So um, at the end of each one, I think we show the book. Um, um, at the, let's see, we tell first about the webinar recordings. Everything is captured. Thanks very much to our local RISA. Uh, that's our um, regional uh, uh, science um, and climate change uh, group uh, funded by NOAA, Dan Bader. Um, and and uh, put uh, puts the put, so they're all posted now. Uh, just to say again about the book, our warming planet, um, it, published by World Scientific. Uh, publishers, um, you see the um, discount code, um, and um, uh, and when you when you do buy the book, or your library buys the book, or your institution buys the book, then um, the all of the slides, all twenty five lectures are available. So um, that's what we like to share at the at the end and show again. The next one coming up on May twenty fifth is on Caribbean coasts will be um, doing two regional uh, lectures. Um, Leonard Nurse, uh, a wonderful, wonderful uh, scholar from, uh, from the Caribbean um, and from the University of West Indies will be speaking. And then two um, wonderful colleagues from Africa, Colleen Vogel and Gina Zervogel. Uh, um, and looking also bringing in some new aspects, um, not only you know from what's up with the climate change impacts in Africa, but also role of urbanization and youth, two very very key, really new emerging topics. And with that, thanks again to our uh, our wonderful lecturers John Hay and Nigel Arnell to Delf, uh, to uh, Nigel Arnell for today. Thank you to all of the participants, and uh, see you in two weeks. We hope to see you in two weeks. Thanks very very much. All the best. <laughs>